How many is glad to be in God's house this morning? How many can say that the decorations here are absolutely stunning? Breathtakingly beautiful. Thank you so much to Sister Jackie and uh, those who helped her prepare the, the uh, platform and most of these decorations. And to Sister Tina Boss, who is just a, one fantastic tree decorator. Man, we appreciate all you folks so very much for the beautiful, beautiful decorations in our sanctuary. And thank you, amen. And to our band, man, you guys are fantastic. Thank you for the wonderful worship today. We appreciate that so very much to all of you. God bless you. Thanks for being in service with us today. We appreciate you being here. To our visitors, we say welcome to you as well. Thanks so much for choosing to come and worship with us this morning here at the Fairlawn Church of God. And I want to uh, open, go ahead and preach a message this morning that God has laid on my heart. It will be a, a two-part message that I will begin today and will conclude next Sunday morning, if the Lord allows. But I have entitled this, The Mystery of the Manger. And there's a lot of specifics, there's a lot of details about the birth of Christ that I want us to, to take a few moments today and next Sunday and really get into, perhaps, and answer some questions that maybe you've had, I know I've had, questions of why. Why? why did things work out, or why were they specifically the way that they were? So I've called it the mystery of the manger. And the text that I have taken for this morning is coming from the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament. If you want to turn in your Bibles, you can to the ninth chapter. The scripture will also be on the screen. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. And this is what the prophet prophesied about the coming Messiah. He said, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Can somebody say amen right there? Thank God for that. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of of peace. Can I tell you, I've said enough right now that I could close this folder and walk away and we could say it has been a good day to be in the house of the Lord, that to us a son is given, to us a child has been born, and the government will be on his shoulders and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. But then the prophet went on to say, of the greatness of of his government in peace, there will be no end. For he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forevermore. Aren't you glad today that you don't serve a Lord of yesterday? You don't just serve a Lord of today, but you serve the Lord that was and the Lord that is and the Lord that forever will be. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, we get to the month of December. It's easy for our Carnal minds, and nothing wrong with this, but the fleshly part of us, we start to think about all the things perhaps in the world that we live in that makes this season so special, makes this season so wonderful. We think about how quick we are, usually sometime around the second or third week of November, we're switching the, the radio over to Q99, or at least I do, because I love those old Christmas classics. What's their thing? Christmas, all Christmas music. All the time or something like that. We love to switch over and hear those Christmas songs. We think about family gatherings. We think about town parades. My little girl got to be in the Pulaski Parade with her dance class last week. What a blessing that was. We think about church banquets. Man, all that wonderful food we're going to enjoy tonight. Hallelujah. We think about concerts we're going to have here in about two weeks with our choir and the kids' church. We think about taking the kids to the mall to get their picture made with Ho, 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 we think about giving, and I looked right at you when I said that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that was a pure accident. We think about, we think about the giving and, and receiving of gifts, right? And, you know, that just happens to be my favorite, hallelujah, giving and receiving gifts. But what I really want to focus our attention on for the next couple of Sundays, can I tell you, is the greatest gift of all time. 
that was ever given to humanity over 2,000 years ago. And this gift did not come wrapped in beautiful, shiny Christmas paper. It wasn't laid under a Christmas tree. But this gift came wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And his name is Jesus, God who was afar off. We just sang about it. God who could not be touched by human hands became Emmanuel, God with us. He exchanged heaven glory for earth and he who is boundless became bound by time and space and he put on flesh and Jesus the Christ entered our world through the door of a manger in a stable outside a makeshift hotel in Bethlehem one author writing of Jesus said this he had no earthly servants and yet they called him master He had no degree, and yet they called him teacher. He had no medicines, and yet they called him healer. He had no earthly army, and yet kings feared him. He won no military battles, and yet he conquered the world. He committed no crime, and yet they crucified him. And he was buried in a borrowed tomb, and yet today he still lives, praise God. Our illustrious narrator in the Easter drama, Sister Kathy, puts it like this. He came as a baby. He lived as a man. He died as our Savior. He rose as our mighty conqueror. And he will very soon return and come back as King of kings and Lord of lords. That's the Jesus that we're talking about here today. Isaiah prophesied some 700 years before he was even born that a child would be born that a son would be given and the government, the power, the authority, the control would not rest on the shoulders of earthly kings and rulers but the government would rest upon his shoulders and he said over his throne, on his throne and over his kingdom he would reign from that time on and forevermore. Can somebody today shout praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus, hallelujah, we're talking about. But here's my question. When it comes to the arrival of Jesus the Christ, my question is this. Why would God, who made the universe out of nothing, who gave the universe unbounded dimensions, why would God, who measured out the stars and the galaxies in the palm of His hand, Why would God, who formed man out of dirt and breathed the very breath of life into him, why would that same God send his only son to the world and make his entryway through the womb of a virgin girl? Why? Why would he make the place of his birth a stable Why would he make the Son of God's bed a feeding trough known as a manger? Why would his audience be animals instead of princes and noblemen? I mean, after all, this is the newborn king of the Jews we're talking about. But this king did not arrive on horseback with sword held high. He wasn't coming with Regal fanfare being introduced with trumpet blasts. This king was coming humbly and quietly. Introduced only to shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night. Why Bethlehem? Why a manger? Why the Virgin Mary? Why a stable? Why the shepherds and the wise men? Why did we call his name Jesus? These are all perhaps if you could call Questions or maybe mysteries of the manger that we want to look at for the next couple of Sundays and soon discover why the mystery of the manger was really the mission of the Messiah. Amen. A mystery, if you look it up in Webster's Dictionary, it is defined as anything that is kept secret or something that is obscure and perhaps puzzling. The New Testament uses a Greek word that is translated as mystery in your Bible in in scriptures like this, Colossians 4 verse 31. Go to that next slide. It says, the mystery of Christ. 
or Mark chapter 4 verse 11 calls it the mystery of the kingdom of God. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 9 says the mystery of our faith. And then Ephesians 6.19 says the mystery of the gospel. Now this Greek word that we translate as mystery uh, actually means this. Something that is outside of the range of natural apprehension. So we cannot perhaps conceive it on our own, but it is made known unto us by divine revelation. So even though it might be beyond the scope of what our natural minds can conceive, can I tell you that these mysteries are made known unto us. They are manifested to us. They are revealed to us by the power of the Holy Spirit who the Bible says searches all things, even the deep things of God. Colossians chapter 1 verses 26 and 27 says the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations past is now disclosed. It is revealed. It is made manifest to God's people. Then it says to them God has chosen to make known the glorious riches of this mystery which is Christ in you the hope of glory. Is anybody glad today that this This mystery has been made known unto you. Is anybody glad today that the stone that the builders rejected has become your cornerstone? It's become the foundation upon which you build your life. Is anybody glad today that God, who was afar off, became Emmanuel? God with us, he is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is the mystery of the gospel Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let me show you something kind of interesting from the scriptures as I was studying and preparing for this. Ephesians, I just mentioned, 619, talked about the mystery of the gospel. Now, what is the gospel? If you look up the, the Greek word, it's translated as good news or to bring or announce good news. So we know, according to Colossians there, this good news, this mystery, this gospel has been kept secret. It's been hidden. It's been obscure. could not be known to people just by natural apprehension. It can only be made known unto us by divine revelation, the good news. We could not know it apart from divine revelation. Now, what was the divine revelation that the angel came and brought to the shepherds that night? The angel said, be not afraid, do not fear, for I bring to you good tidings. Or most translations say this, I bring to you good news. Now what was the good news? Also translated as the gospel. The next scripture, I bring to you good news. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be the sign unto you. You shall find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. That was the mystery that had been kept secret, had been hidden, but was being disclosed by divine revelation, being made known unto God's people. The mystery, the good news. Think about the divine revelation that Jesus gave to those standing in the temple on the Sabbath day as he held the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and he began to read these words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim what? The good news, the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That is the mystery of the gospel that has now been disclosed. It's been revealed and made manifest to you and I. The mystery of the gospel. What is that mystery that for God so loved the world that he gave us Jesus? That he gave us Jesus. Watch this. How many is thankful for that gift today? Man, praise God. Just for a few moments, I want to look at just a few questions that I have pondered on myself. Perhaps you have as well this morning. The first is this. 
when we think about the mystery of the manger, why did God become a man? How many of you know that he, Jesus, was 100% God? He did not lay down his divinity to pick up humanity. Amen? He was 100% God, and at the same time, 100% man. What, what was the necessity that God become a man, clothed in flesh, as it were, flesh and blood? In the beginning, we know, was God. And God created everything that has ever been created, including mankind. According to Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, we were created with a purpose. And that was for His pleasure. It was to bring Him glory. We were created to be a part of the infinite family of God. But with just one act of our rebellious, sinful, carnal nature... With just one sin, a great gulf was created. A gap was created. A schism was created that separated the creator from the creation. So what was an all-loving, all-compassionate God going to do that was determined to restore a right relationship between him and man? Since man could not rise to God's level God would come to ours and he would clothe his divinity with flesh, become Emmanuel, God with us, and walk among us. This is what Paul said in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. The necessity of God becoming a man. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, listen, made under the law. Why? So that he could redeem them that were under the law so that we might receive adoption as his sons. Is anybody received the redemption plan of salvation today? Aren't you glad you've been redeemed by the crimson blood of Jesus that was shed for the remission of our sins today? God became flesh. Why? So that he could substitute himself for the sins of of the flesh. He who was knew no sin became sin for us, the Bible said, so that we could become the righteousness of God. He was our kinsman redeemer. In other words, he redeemed those from the law to whom he was related by flesh and blood. God came as a man, clothed in flesh, to pay the penalty for all mankind. Then what Hebrew says that by that one perfect sacrifice we could be set free forever from the law of sin and death because of that one sacrifice once and for all. It's the terminology that Hebrews uses. Philippians chapter 2 verse 7 and 8 tells us this, Jesus was by his very nature God. He was God. But he emptied himself and he took upon himself the form of a servant. He was fashioned in the likeness of man and he became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Why? Because he did not want to spend an eternity without you. It was his plan of reconciliation so that he could redeem those that were under the law so that we could be set free forever from the law of sin and death. That is why God was born a baby, came as a man. Now another question that leads me to is, I understand perhaps maybe why then he came as a man, why he had to be flesh and blood, but why was his birthplace a stable in Bethlehem? Has anybody ever wondered that same question? Why would the Son of God be born in a stable in Bethlehem? Now, there are a, a few perhaps reasons for the location of Bethlehem. Let me give you just a couple. The first would be the fulfillment of prophecy. Again, some 700 years before the birth of Christ, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Holds a prophecy about the Christ child's birth. It said this, But you, 
Bethlehem Ephrata, meaning fruitful. Though you are small among the clans of Judah, but out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel. There's that word again, ruler, reign, king, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. So it was the fulfillment of this prophecy that had been given hundreds of years before he was ever born. Another reason that perhaps Bethlehem would be chosen is that Bethlehem already bore such a great legacy Among the people of Israel, it was the location of Rachel, Jacob's wife, her burial site. It was the hometown of Naomi, the place where she returned with Ruth. Bethlehem was the place where the prophet Samuel came and anointed David king. And do you know that all three of those names, Rachel, Naomi, and David, all three happened to show up in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Another reason perhaps Bethlehem will be chosen is its name. The name Bethlehem means the house of bread. What more fitting of a place for the Son of God to be born than the man who called himself the living bread, the bread of life, the bread from heaven that will satisfy every longing of your soul. What better place for him to be born than the place that is called the house of bread, Bethlehem. But why a stable? Now the word stable doesn't necessarily show up in the scriptures, but it is implied Because we understand that Mary laid the baby in a manger, which we would know is more better fitting, we would understand today, as a feeding trough for animals. She laid him in that manger. So we believe his birthplace to be something like a barn or like a stable. See, the Son of God could have arrived in a palace with all the regal fanfare that goes along with being a king. Not just any king, but the king of all kings. But this king did not come in a palace, but he came in a stable. Why? Because he wanted to identify with the least of those, with the least of us. He wanted to be able to empathize with the feelings of our infirmities. He wanted to be able to commune and understand the poor and the vulnerable. Listen to the verse of Scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. It says, Though he was rich, but for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. Can I tell you something, folks? You may not have a lot in this world. You may not have a lot of earthly possessions. You may not own a lot of money. You may not have a lot of houses or cars. But can I tell you, you are rich among the richest. To know that your name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. To know that every sin stain has been washed away in the life-giving flow of the blood of Jesus. That's why he didn't come to a palace. He came poor so that he might make you rich today. He chose the least so you could have the most. He made his entrance in a stable in Bethlehem. Why? So that you and I could dwell in a palace in paradise forever. I'm sure if Mary and Joseph would have had their pick, they would have chosen perhaps a hotel room, some place at least with a bed. I mean, this is God. We're talking about, folks. I mentioned a moment ago all the things that he's done. That's just barely scratching the surface. I mean, this is the God who hung a star in the sky just to tell the, these wise men from the east where to find where the Christ child would be. Hung a star. Could he not provide one humble room in Bethlehem for his son to be born? So why was there no room in the inn? Why was there no room? It wasn't by mere accident. Can I tell you, this was pre-planned by God from the beginning. 
He was the lamb, the Bible says, slain from the foundation of the world. Every detail, every minute detail was pre-planned by God from the beginning. So why? Why no room in the end? Because a homeless life would, or homeless birth rather, would be reflective of his homeless life. We see him born in Bethlehem. Whisked away quickly to Egypt, grew up in Nazareth, traveled frequently back and forth to Jerusalem. We never really find him at home. He even had this to save himself in Luke chapter 9, verse 58. He said, Foxes have dens to live in, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to even lay his head. He was rejected by the world, rejected by humanity, even at his birth. But he chose that path. And he continued to walk that lonely road that led from the manger all the way to the cross. Because see, when the Son of God came, can I tell you, he really wasn't that concerned about making room in an inn. Where he wanted there to be room was in your heart. I read a story about this little church was putting on a Christmas play about this time of year. This little young child, about nine or ten years old, little boy, had played the part of the innkeeper. And he had learned his lines. I'm closing with this. The musicians want to come back. He was going over his lines over and over. There's no room in the end. There's no room in the end. He practiced it and practiced it. Had it down. The night of the play came and here comes Mary and Joseph. Two other children portraying that part. And they knocked on the door of the makeshift inn there at the church. The little innkeeper young man came and opened the door and looked at Mary and Joseph. And Joseph said, do you have any room? For us tonight, my wife is with child. The innkeeper knew his lines. He said, no, sir, there's no room in the inn. Joseph looked at him again, and he said, surely there's something here. He said, my wife is carrying the Son of God. Surely you've got one room for us for the night. The innkeeper thought for just a moment. He paused and as, as, as if almost he was going to say something else. And he stopped himself and he said, No, I said, be gone. There's no room in the inn. So Joseph and Mary turned around and they started to walk away. And as they did, a tear started rolling down the face of that little nine year old innkeeper. And he said, Wait a minute. Don't go. Don't go. The lady that was directing the play, she kind of gasped in the back. No, this wasn't a part of the play. It wasn't a part of the lines. She had no idea what little innkeeper was about to say. He said, wait, Joseph. Wait, Mary. He just could not bear to turn the Son of God away one more time. He said, there may not be room in the inn. But you can have my room. See, Jesus came to a world that made no room for him. But he came for one reason. And that was to make room for all of us. One of the translations of the Gospel of John says it like this when Jesus was talking to his disciples. He said, there is plenty enough room in my Father's house. And that is where I'm about to go to make a place for you. He wants to be born again. Not in a manger. Not in a stable. Not even in a room in the inn. But the Son of God today would like to be born again in your heart. So that where He is, there you and I 
can be also.